are beautiful, we're irrefutable, we are omnipotent, we're militant, resilient, we're autonomous, we are the consequence, we are consciousness. Feral, adjective, especially of an animal, in a wild state, after escape, from captivity or domestication. Alcatraz, Arab Spring, one billion rising, freedom schools, the maroons, rebellion thriving, we've been rising since the dawn of creation, sun, in the blood of our veins, liberation runs. Welcome to Feral Visions, a decolonial feminist podcast brought to you by Liberation Spring. I'm your host, Angelina Thupadia. We begin with a content note or trigger warning. Here at Feral Visions, we go deep, and that often means courageously addressing white supremacist, imperialist, heteropatriarchal, capitalist, settler colonial violence in order to support healing and transformation. Bypassing isn't an option, the only way is through. The time for denial is over, and today's a great day to keep it real. Amidst the show's focus on unapologetic truth-telling, then, please practice excellent self and community care while listening. For me personally, it was when I was 20 in a co-op in college that I first remember being most explicitly exposed, no pun intended, to ethical non-monogamy. It was California in the early 2000s. There was some POC presence in those spaces, with hippies and pagans, activists and radicals. Their major point of reference was often the book The Ethical Slut. And then, within the dominant culture, there was that wife-swapping and swinging that played out through predictably heterosexist objectification. It usually evoked for me an image of throngs of white people hypersexualizing themselves and each other, with a focus on having physical and sexual contact. They were super into getting off with lots of other people. There was an emphasis on physical sexual activity at the expense of all the wider possibilities of what could have otherwise been created. Then, in mostly communities of color, lots of folks copied that behavior and thought it was even more interesting because it was people of color copying that white shit. Then there was also some heteropatriarchal fuckery around polygamy. That relational practice usually looked like cis-hetero men having sex with multiple women and acting like that's somehow a form of getting in touch with their roots and sticking it to white supremacy. And you know there was a gendered double standard where women couldn't do the same, even if they wanted to. It was like nobody could care less about being decolonial, let alone caring about power dynamics on any of the fronts. Sure, orgasms and lovers can be great, but was I the only one who was putting our collective liberation and conversation with this basic, hypersexualized conformity? Like, the only conversations worth having about open relationships were having sex with as many people as possible, as opposed to, oh, I don't know, sharing childcare, emotional labor, and all of the other possibilities more grounded in a historical framework. Did anyone else smell a heteropatriarchal bias? Amidst that ridiculousness, on today's episode of Feral Visions, we're talking about moving beyond settler colonial approaches to sexuality and relationships. You know how most everyone has been super brainwashed by this dominant culture and the corporate media propaganda we're saturated in? Well, that means our notions of sex and sexuality have been poisoned also. So one part of decolonizing our minds, bodies, communities, and society involve unlearning just about everything the mainstream colonial society has taught us about sex and relationships. And you know we're doing this work from an unapologetically feminist perspective, because decolonization is that important. We'll delve into the inadequacy of the English language for doing this work, 
and the potentially liberatory possibilities of reconnecting with our mother tongues to find clues towards freedom in our ancestors' languages. We'll also address the importance of considering relationships in a way that attends to relationality with non-human animals, child rearing, tending for the sick and elderly, and not just reducing a discussion of relationships to that usual polyamorous lasciviousness. To support this intervention, I am so honored to have as our guest today, Dr. Kim Talbert. Dr. Kim Talbert is an associate professor in Native Studies at the University of Alberta and author of the book Native American DNA, Tribal Belonging and the False Promise of Genetic Science, among many other publications. Dr. Talbert completed a PhD from the History of Consciousness program at UC Santa Cruz. She's formerly held professorships at Arizona State University at Tempe and the Department of American Indian Studies the Department of Environmental Science, Policy and Management at UC Berkeley, and the Departments of Anthropology and Native American and Indigenous Studies at UT Austin. In 2016, the Government of Canada awarded her a Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Peoples, Technoscience and Environment. In 2013, she finished a three-year term as an elected member of the Council of NISA, the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association. She is also an elected officer of the Society for Cultural Anthropology. Dr. Talbert is a founding member of the advisory board for the University of Illinois Institute for Genomic Biology's Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples and Genomics, and an editorial board member for the UK-based journal Science as Culture. She has also advised the president of the American Society of Human Genetics, on issues related to genomics and indigenous peoples. She's created the blogs, Indigenous Peoples, Technoscience, Environment, and The Critical Polyamorist. I'll stop my very abbreviated sharing of her accolades there as her accomplishments are extensive. She's also an enrolled member of the Sisseton Wapatinoyate in South Dakota. Thank you so much for being with us today. How are you doing this morning? I'm good, thank you. So I would like to just start off by sharing my gratitude for the work that you do. One thing that I'm especially appreciative of is around your work, how it's sort of gesturing towards some glimmer of possibility around um, relationality, around the erotic beyond the sort of dominant US culture's mediocrity to make it plain on that front. And so I'm wondering if you could share with our listeners a little bit about the work that you do at your blog, The Critical Polyamorist, please. Well, you know, I started writing that blog in uh, 2013, I think it was, or maybe 2014, just as a way for me to process my personal journey or practice of polyamory. And um, I mean, I am an anthropologist, so I'm also familiar with insider anthropology and autoethnography, and I thought, well, why don't I bring those methodological skills to reflect on my own life? And as I moved through this new cultural community, and at the time I was in Austin, Texas, and so because if I don't understand something, I, I can't be happy unless I have understanding of what's going on, and so I'm, I'm pretty self-reflexive about everything. And I didn't want to just do it and experiment. I wanted to really uh, sort of uh, increase my understanding of myself and of the world and my place in the world. And I'm not a big believer in therapy, so I kind of do <laughs> autoethnography on myself. <laughs> so, more just sure. because it's inconvenient and costs money. You know, and, I, and I like the, me the anthropological material I produce. So, so anyway, I started doing that blog, and I really, you know, you learn a lot when you write about something, right? And then I brought my creative writing practice back into it with the Critical Poly 100s, which I hadn't been doing creative writing in 20, 20 years since I went back and became an academic. And so what I guess what I was trying to do besides that thing through my own stuff was also just send, you know, I felt like a, a, a faraway planet, you know, sending radio signals out into the universe. I just was hoping that some people out there who think about the intersections of non-monogamy, settler colonialism, race, you know, gender would would pick up on that, that I would find people to talk to. And I don't get tons of comments, but I do I do get some and they're very powerful and I get a pretty decent circulation of the of the blog posts when I actually put them on social media. 
And so, yeah, I have, and then I've also been invited to give talks, which has really kind of increased my community. So I recently keynoted the Solo Polyamory Conference, the first one ever in Vancouver, although I got sick and had to do it by Skype. But I've actually then since met some of the people in that community, and I'm really developing this kind of solo polyamory community over Facebook. There's going to be a meeting in Seattle in the next year, which I'm hoping to go to. So for me, this is kind of at least a national or international community between the U.S. and Canada so far and of course there are polyamory researchers all all over the world there's a conference coming up in Vienna uh, next month I think so uh, yeah through that blog I was able to build a virtual community when it's sometimes hard to have a community in in the city that you live in because polyamory is still a very much a minority practice and you're you're a minority in so many ways and especially being an indigenous woman I'm not hoping that I'm going to find a really vibrant community of like-minded thinkers, even polyamory folks in the cities that I live in, because it's not only non-monogamy I'm dealing with, which is completely going against the societal grain. It's the fact that I'm a feminist, Mm -hmm. that I'm Mm anti-racist, that I'm anti-settler colonialism, and Mm -hmm. I think that those are conversations that should be central to ethical non-monogamy, and most polyamorous never think about those things, as far as I can tell. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it's exactly right on that front that I'm also so appreciative of your work, because, you know, in the dominance society, the sort of understanding of ethical non-monogamy is like either wife swapping or swinging or some kind of, you know, just like the same old heterosexist objectification without attention to imagining beforehand and otherwise the ways, right, that our ancestors might have practiced relationality or kinship. So it's that sort of intervention into the realm of ethical non-monogamy, to use that fraught language, so to speak, around making kin and around relationality that I'm so appreciative of in your work. Could you elaborate maybe a little bit upon that for folks, especially for POC, for Native folks, for oppressed peoples that are, you know, maybe starting to realize right now in their journeys how hustled we've been by this capitalist propaganda of the nuclear, right, cis, heterosexual, um, monogamous marriage as a unit for relating how you're expanding your understanding beyond that practice. Yeah, sure. And I just wanted to say, I was at a conference at Penn State this spring, and Zakia Jackson was there. And I think Zakia graduated from Berkeley. I knew her there. She is, what does she call herself, a diasporic uh, African-American feminist, I think. And she does a critical animal studies and critical relations stuff, too, like I do. And she said to me, why do you call it ethical non-monogamy? That implies, or ethical non-monogamy, that implies that monogamy is ethical. I'm like, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Not ethical usually. Thank so you. I've been trying to call it open non-monogamy or yes, something else. Right. It's like that's so funny that she caught me on that. Yeah, so I you know, when I started doing this, of course, the model that we have is this Western kind of white middle class, uh, you know, non polyamory or whatever the forms that you talked about swinging as well. Mm-hmm. There are they're very, very heterosexual driven in many ways. There's a whole lot of queer folks who do other kinds of forms of critical relations, right? And and not and non monogamy, but they might not use the same terms that straight people often do. Yeah, for me, when I started doing it, it's just, it felt so right, even given the critiques, the, the, the racial and the settler colonial critiques that I have of the way it gets practiced, it felt really right, the way it opened up uh, the fluidity of my relationships, so I was able to defetishize sexuality by embracing such an open form of sexuality, and so really able to realize the kinds of gradations between sexual touch and other forms of intimate touch and it made me more receptive to non-sexual forms of intimate touch I used to be a person who really didn't like to be touched and as I paid more attention to consent of course but also to the the sort of ways in which we get touch deprived in our society that that fetishizes and represses sexuality it really damages healthy kinds of touch right and so that expanded to me having more fluidity among my different relationships i was very ready to defetishize the couple mm-hmm. because in my history you know we are a non-monogamous people dakota people we had plural marriage 
until a nuclear family and monogamy and state-sanctioned marriage was imposed on us along with compulsory uh, conversions to Christianity. So Christianity came along with residential schools or boarding schools. Children were removed from families. They were put into these schools. They were forbidden from speaking our indigenous languages. Marriage was imposed along with private property regimes. So the, all of this came together within a span of a, a generation. Uh, the, the federal government and along with the churches, the churches and the feds were in bed together, imposed all of this on indigenous people. And suddenly, you know, we're, we're caught up in this kind of system that really disrupted our relationships with each other. We lived in extended families in Dakota communities. We call that the Tiosh Baye, with another word for extended family. That kind of reaches out into the Oyate, which is the word we use for tribe or people now. But it was sets of extended families governing ourselves together. Uh, there were reasons why, why plural marriage existed that we don't know how sexual or non-sexual those plural marriages were. They were about taking care of children, taking care of partners, taking care of the elderly, about taking care of the community and forming an alliance as a couple, but with multiple, it, it, it was plural wives, but uh, divorce was flexible. So women could kick the guy out. Household property belonged to the women. The teepee belonged to the woman. So women had a lot of uh, economic agency. And what happens when the federal government and the Christian church comes in and imposes monogamy and nuclear family is they take away the agency of women. Women can no longer hold property at the turn of the 20th century. The, the Allotment Act that gave a land to settlers and it gave land to indigenous people and forced them into these nuclear families, the head of household is the one who owned the land. Well, that's a man. Mm -hmm. And the man gets more land if he has a wife and he gets yet more land if he has children. And women didn't have property rights. So this completely undercut women's agency. It tied them up with men into these lifelong marriages that they couldn't leave. Divorce wasn't legal, you know, and, until quite recently. So yeah, the whole thing is just th this incredibly oppressive system where it's monogamy goes hand in hand with forced conversion. It goes hand mm -hmm. in hand with private property. Mm -hmm. And people need to see the links between those things. So when I hear polyamorous say, oh, well, it's an individual choice. I choose to be poly, you choose to be monogamous. <laughs> They're both valid choices. In my mind, no, that's, that's not right. just individual choice. There's a whole compulsory monogamy system tied up with private property that's been mm -hmm. shoved down our throats. That's right. And this is one of the reasons that I actually think open non-monogamy is in fact the more ethical choice Thank you. because it's going up against that settler colonial state of affairs and monogamy is buying into it. And until mm -hmm. we have a world in which there's not this system forcing monogamy onto us ideologically and legally, mm -hmm. I don't really believe it's a choice for very many people. So. Thank you. Yeah, let's put that in conversation with consent. If no isn't a viable option legally, familially, then it, how is it even consensual to opt into an alternative? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I look at all the, you know, the different partners I've had too. How many, I'm lucky that I'm an academic. I'm lucky that I come from a family that is proud of our Dakota history. And even while we might be a little bit like, oh my God, yeah, we were non-monogamous. What do I think of that? I come from a family and a culture that if they hear this explanation from me, they'd be like, okay, that's, that's valid. I don't, Nobody would threaten to take my children away. My mm -hmm. ex-husband is a feminist. He's mm -hmm. anti-racist. He knows what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole lot of people out there that worry about getting their children taken away. They worry mm -hmm. about losing their jobs. They mm -hmm. worry about being completely disowned by their families. I fail to see how monogamy then is really a choice. It's it's mm -hmm. it's kind of a dangerous step to make for a lot of people. And I'm lucky that I have the space in my life as a Dakota person, as a feminist, and as an academic to be able to do things that are more against the grain than what a lot of people can do. Right, thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, there's also the class dimension as well. And then you spoke yes. to region, right? Geography, how that informs. And then with the internet, the ways in which we can and can't connect with folks. So yeah, so right. important to name. Right. For sure. Yeah, no, class is big, right? Yeah, I mean, I have a nice professor job and, you know, as opposed to, yeah, if I was living on the reservation, right? Like, I, yeah, I can go to Vancouver and have community and, yeah. Right, uh-huh, <laughs> uh-huh, sure. You know, something that you wrote on your blog that resonates so deeply for me is this quote, I have multiple human loves, but the prairies and their rivers and skies are the most enduring loves of my heart, end quote. So how that's not speciest, it's not anthropocentric or human centered. So when you were talking earlier about desexualizing touch and intimacy, I'm also wanting to underscore the importance of not being so human centered around this dialogue, especially in this moment 
of amplified ecocide. I was hoping that maybe you could elaborate on that quote, that idea, how you understand love, actually, in a way that is not so boundaried. You know, it's interesting. I was a professor at UC Berkeley from 2008 to 2013 before I went to Texas, and I was really, really unhappy in the Bay Area. I had a great job and great colleagues, brilliant students, but I was really deeply unhappy. And I was also still in a traditional marriage, and I couldn't figure it out, you know, because my co-parent is a wonderful human being like if you want a heterosexual husband he's like the best (laughs) he's just he's awesome I can't say enough good I'm like what is my problem well I had to move away from the Bay Area and move away from that marriage to figure out what it was I didn't know if it was that I was deeply unhappy in coastal California landscape or if it was the marriage it turns out he had nothing to do with it it's the traditional marriage structure that made me feel incredibly oppressed and restricted but also the Bay Area as a landscape I need to be on flat land. I need to have the skies be three quarters of what's in my vision and the land is the rest. I mean, the skies, when you're on the prairie, the skies are the canvas. They're the painting. The skies are what make you feel alive. And the land is just kind of a foundation to look at the skies, which is what the art is and which is what the life is. And the skies here are violent. You know, we have thunderstorms and lightning and wind. And the skies to me in the Bay Area are dead. It is always Mm. blue. Mm. There's a little bit of fog and clouds. There's never thunder and lightning. Mm -hmm. There's no violence. Like Mm. they're just completely chilled out skies, right? And the other (laughs) thing is there's all kinds of hills there. And I don't like being in hills and mountains. Mm. I feel jostled about. I feel like somebody's pushing me around. Mm. And the ocean scares me. Mm. So really... I'm a prairie person mm-hmm. and when I and I just feel so much more at peace out here but I had to move away from my human relationship that was there and that that state centered structure and I had to move out of that landscape back to the prairies at home and I'm a very river centered person so I also was very much ruminating on those relationships as I was writing the critical polyamorous blog so it started out being about my human romantic relationships and then it kind of branched out into this notion that's more critical relationality right how am I in relation with all of my loves and those are not just human Mm -hmm. and they're not just romantic or sexual loves right Mm -hmm. thank you for that and so bringing in the plant realm then I'm curious to know so so appreciative of what you're bringing in around rivers around prairies around place also I'm wondering if you could share with our listeners a plant, maybe just one that you have a particularly special relationship with. And, you know, the cosmos or the limit, it could be whatever plant you like and in whatever way you like, but just really inviting folks to take seriously returning to consensual relationships with plants. You know, it's interesting. My grandmothers were both gardeners and I was raised with my great grandmother, my grandmother and my mother. My mom's not a gardener as much as my grandmothers were. And I didn't really pay attention when I was young to that. I was always had my nose in a book. But now that I'm older, I'm almost 50. I'm starting to garden and have flowers and things like that. And I have a lot of plants in my house. And I'm kind of moving into the space where I think my grandmothers were. So I don't yet feel like I have a particular plant that I have a really important relationship with. I am becoming very partial to all of my herbs and thinking a lot about not having plants that are just decorative, but that Mm -hmm. that can also be nourishing. But I still like pretty flowers. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is on the prairies, and this is one of the things, again, I didn't like about Berkeley, and I know this is counterintuitive for a lot of people. We had this big flowering backyard. Things flower all year long there. We had you know, we had mint and herbs and flowers and garden boxes. And I was sick because my allergies were nonstop, like Mm. 24 seven, 365 days a year out there. I need the austere landscape of the prairies. It's messy out in Berkeley in Mm. the Bay area. It's Mm. just messy with flowers and plants. Mm. And here there are trees, you know, just a beautiful tree or a stand of trees. And then there's a whole lot of land in between. So I'm still kind of very much into this really austere landscape and then the trees become very important out here right because they're breaks from the wind they Mm -hmm. line the rivers Mm -hmm. so yeah we'll see what happens but I will pay attention to that question as I go forward and see the kinds of you know maybe more intimate relationships I develop with it's probably going to be trees and Mm -hmm. then herbs Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank (laughs) you for that 
So I know that you teach a class on decolonizing sexualities. And so I saw that you mentioned that you, for the final paper, invite students to refrain from using the English words sex or sexuality and are encouraging folks to move beyond also super appreciative in your work of you're just unapologetically naming how inadequate English is as a language for us to do certain kinds of decolonial thought and praxis and an invitation for folks to actually get reacquainted with some of their ancestral tongues to then be able to again remember and then imagine otherwise. Could you elaborate a little bit on that prompt for students and the kind of journey of unlearning and learning that you curate for folks around decolonizing what in English would be called sex and sexualities. Yeah, and I also do that, I realized in the paper I had to do that with the word nature too and anything to do with nature because sex and nature are very similar types of concepts, right? Yeah, they have a hard time, so they end up using sexually explicit terms, like they'll use the F word, mm -hmm, sure. <laughs> they'll use the word intercourse, but they'll pay a lot more attention to what precisely they're referring to that bodies are doing together. They'll spend a lot more time thinking about the way that uh, sex and gender relate to one another or get tied together. And they do have a really hard time, and they always come back to me, well, I, what about this quote? The word sexuality is in the quote, and I'm like, okay, you can use the quote, but I want you to try to find a way not to use those kinds of quotes really I want you to break it down into what bodies are doing into what hearts are doing I want you to think about the social relations that are going along with the thing that you're writing about so I'm trying to think of an example of some of the papers and it's funny nothing's coming to mind right now in terms of what they write about but it is a real struggle for them and I have a lot of Cree students up here and they will you know try to dig into the language but one of the problems they run into is they say that and I do believe this, and it's true for a lot of tribal cultures, our language that we would use around explicit things that we would call sex in English, that part of the language has been dampened and forgotten and lost sometimes because there was so much shame around sexuality by the missionaries, right? Uh, and in the residential schools. So, so there is a sense that my students have that their elders, even though they might speak the language, won't necessarily say those words. They may not necessarily know them. And so then we talk a lot about, you know, this is where the theory comes in. I use a, a good friend of mine's work, uh, David Shorter. He teaches at UCLA. And David has uh, two essays, one called Spirituality and one called Sexuality, where he talks about, I'm going to give you a line of theory here, he talks about something called objectivating the intersubjective. And he says that what we think of as sexuality and spirituality is really intersubjective, meaning it's a set of relations, right, between different subjects. And when we want to create this thing called sex or nature or spirituality or spirit, we're taking all of those relations and we're making them into an object. So we're objectifying those relations. And I try to get my students to de-objectify those relations, to stop thinking about sex as a thing. You know, when, when I say, well, what is sex? Define it. They'll say, well, it's it's sexual intercourse or sex has to do with these specific parts of our bodies. And I said, I want you to stop thinking about it like that, right? I want you to think about what relations are at stake and how are you relating to, to different human beings? I don't know if that's mm -hmm. a helpful response. Yeah. That's great. But it's, it's a challenging paper for them. It really is. But I, I think it's a really good exercise too. And they learn some theory while they're at it. So, and I do this mm -hmm. with undergrads. So mm -hmm. undergrads can do theory too. Thank you. Absolutely. Right. And on that topic of challenges that folks encounter as they're attempting to unlearn the sort of dominant settler colonial propaganda and then potentially remember alternatives that are actually genealogically meaningful for each of us to then potentially practice something different. I'd be curious to know, in terms of your own process and journey through this work, what is a challenge that you might be encountering now or something that you're personally quite curious about as you're growing and evolving your understanding? Of non-monogamy? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, a lot of the times when you go to these, you know, polyamory conversation groups or whatever, people mostly talk about jealousy and time management. <laughs> <laughs> right. These are not the real issues to me, right? I mean, Thank you. you know, it's it's about changing the world. That's the real issue That's to right. me. And so I think probably my biggest challenge was deciding to not do the blog anonymously. So I did it anonymously at first. And I don't know, I guess I was living in Texas. You know, I, I checked in with my dean multiple times here as he was trying to recruit me to move up here. 
I said, are you sure I can be open about this? Because if I'm getting asked to do talks on this now and it's kind of moving into the realm of my research and I want to publish on it, and are people going to think you're hiring some crazy flake from the United States, you know? <laughs> and, and he said, no, no. It's, I think there was something about being in the U.S. It actually is even more sex repressed yeah. um, uh, than it is in Canada. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and Texas might have been that way, too. California certainly wasn't, but I wasn't in California anymore. But I was really, really nervous about not being anonymous. And I part of that also was I wanted to have a really good nuanced analysis intellectual analysis of what polyamory was for me and I wanted to have it really well thought out in terms of its links to being anti-colonial before I kind of came out and was open about it because yeah I guess I just didn't want to look like I was being silly or frivolous or whatever and then as I started to get my my analyses I think more sophisticated and more well thought out and as I started to connect with other polyamory researchers and other people who were being more intersectional, right, about the ways they were thinking about their sexuality in relationship to non-monogamy, I became more comfortable with where I was. And I also decided when I got up here, because there are so many in Canada, young indigenous uh, queer people who are doing a lot of amazing activism around sexual decolonization, I thought, you know, if these young people, 19, 20 years old, 16 years old, are out working on these issues, I need to step up. Like, I was like, you can't, I, you need to have more courage. Look at these mm. young people. Mm. So really, those those young queer, indigenous, and two-spirit people were really a big inspiration for me because I was so grateful for what they were doing in the world, and I thought, oh, well, I probably might have a few examples to offer people, too, and I want people out there to know that there are other people that are deeply dissatisfied and, in fact, miserable with the state of affairs in terms of what's considered a legitimate relationship. You know, I cannot stress enough how just deeply unhappy I was in a normative marriage. And again, it has nothing to do with the person, right? It is Mm -hmm. the structure. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a language for understanding that. Mm -hmm. You know, no language at all. And I could have, we could have gone to couples therapy. No therapist would have told me I was deeply dissatisfied with settler colonial marriage. Thank you. They would have had the answers. They would have, have, you know, said, oh, you're phobic or whatever. (laughs) Sure. Of totally course. not commitment phobic. You right. know, I'm deeply committed to my co-parent. I just don't want to live in a normative marriage with it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm also yeah. so appreciative of your sharing those personal stories, which does involve such vulnerability, like you named, yeah. you know, especially professionally, depending upon the vacations that we have. Because for so many folks, that can be terrifying. Actually naming, you know, this isn't just some interesting political let alone sexual or intellectual foray but it's so deeply personal that intertwining of the personal and the political all of those realms when it comes to this topic that has been rendered in some ways so taboo so sensitive and the like so shame inducing for a lot of folks especially in the u.s and so thank you so much for having the bravery to share with folks some of that sort of part of your journey of coming to do the work that you're doing right now. Oh, thank you. Yeah. No, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm I'm really fortunate. I think so. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm really Mm -hmm. fortunate. There's so many people who don't have the privilege that I have. So Mm -hmm. I I get why people don't come out about being non-monogamous. I get it. You know, I don't hold that against people ever. One of the other challenges was I decided for about two seconds at one point, because I was seeing somebody I really liked and his wife couldn't handle open non-monogamy. They lived in a very conservative community in Texas and she was worried about people seeing us out, he and I, and we had to stop seeing each other. And I thought, well, I just can't see these people anymore that are new to this or that aren't living in a community where they can be fully out. But you know what? I can't do that because I'm attracted to people that are my own age, basically, (laughs) you know, and people my age are, it's a conservative generation, you know, people in their late forties and their fifties, we didn't grow up in the world that these young millennials are growing up in. Right. Mm -hmm. And we have these very textured, involved communities full of people that are really going to cause a lot of emotional and personal difficulty for us if we you know just because I can be out doesn't mean a lot of the people that I might be interested in can be out and I just 
I don't want to date 20 year olds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, right. I, I, I like being with people that we have the same cultural references and life experience and they were probably also around in the sixties, you For know? Sure. Yeah. So that's just not something I'm willing to do. And so I've had to really learn to be tolerant of the different levels of privilege that people have. So the whole thing every day is such a learning experience, you know, but there's no perfectly political place to stand. We all live in a compromised kind of set of politics and it's made me a lot more tolerant tolerant, I guess, too. Well said. Thank you for that. You mentioned some inspirations that you've been learning from with some youth and some activists and organizers, Two-Spirit First Nations folks in Canada. Could you maybe share a couple of examples of either projects that have been invigorating for you, or I don't know whether or not you might be referencing, say, certain bands or artists or collectives, but folks that are doing the work? Well, you know, there's an organization up here that's just so visionary and important. It's called Native Youth Sexual Health Network, or NISHN, mm -hmm, NYSHN, mm -hmm. and they've also come down into the United States. They're just so inspiring. They're really, to me, they're really young. I mean, they're in their 20s. Some of them are in their teens, even. Mm -hmm. um, they do things like they get expired condoms and they take them out into communities with youth and they beat the edge of the condom to get youth comfortable with touching condoms. Like, they're an mm -hmm. everyday kind of item that mm -hmm. you should... Be comfortable with they also do something what is it they they bead a, they make a little beaded bracelets for people to know their cycle you right. know so you know when you're ovulating and when you're mm -hmm. most fertile and again there's a community practice in that and they're very good about gender fluidity as well and chosen gender identity and, and all that but they'll sit around in a circle and there's a cultural aspect to this well where where usually women but it doesn't only have to be women will come together and bead and, and do artwork together and during that time you talk and there's cultural transmission and there's mutual support, right? Emotional engagement as well. And then they're also doing something educational around bodies and sex. And they've also been huge advocates for transgender rights, for two-spirit rights. And they deeply tie up decolonization and sexuality. So they're such a tremendous inspiration. And I really have learned a lot from watching how they tie different issues together. So that's one of the main groups that I think about. And in general, there's a lot of two-spirit activism across Canada. There's a lot of support of Indigenous sex workers and sex workers' rights. I don't see that as much in the United States. Mm -hmm. So a much, much more open conversation up here tying repressive sexualities to colonization in a way that in the United States, I don't feel like we insert sexuality enough into the conversation. So I'm grateful to be up here and learning from people up here. Absolutely. And on that front, moving from the realm of, say, maybe more abstract or academic theory and organizing to the aesthetic realm and to the realm of senses, are there songs, poems, stories that have been inspiring your own process of how you understand and practice decolonizing sexuality for yourself? I know for my students, I'm really wanting to encourage folks to take seriously on all of those realms, the sort of interconnectedness of what it means to actually embody and move into doing the thing. So not just talking about it with words, but any inspiration you could share around that practice. Yeah, I mean, I've been lucky to be meeting more artists and writers because I'm co-producing with two other Indigenous women up here this show called Teepee Confessions, which is a sexy storytelling show modeled on bedpost confessions out of Austin, Texas. But we're also incorporating more Indigenous burlesque. So there's a couple of things. There are some really great writers in Canada. We just had perform for us Tenille Campbell, who is, uh, I think Tenille is Cree. But she also was talking to Dene people in her performance. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, Tania lives in Saskatoon and she's got a new book out called Indian Love Poems, which is just lovely. And mm. she's really fantastic on stage. I just love her work so much. And then we also had um, there's a there's a movement uh, to do indigenous burlesque up here. And there is a group out of Vancouver called Virago Nation, which is a bunch of indigenous burlesque dancers, some of them two spirit identified. And they really are, again, linking up the practice of burlesque with decolonization. And, and there's a lot of talk up here with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where you've got residential school survivors giving testimony about the abuse that they suffered in residential schools and the way that's filtered down through multi-generational trauma among Indigenous people up here. So there's very much a, a linking within that artistic community of repressive sexualities and sexual dysfunction to the residential school uh, experience. So Virago Nation's doing burlesque, and then there's a new indigenous burlesque troupe coming up in Edmonton called the Beaver Hills Burlesque Collective, which is a double <laughs> entendre, because this place apparently in Cree was called Beaver Hills. Mm. So yeah, it's so vibrant up here, artistically, intellectually, in terms of activism. 
and people are really good here about linking those things together. There's so much crossover between artists and theoretical work in the academy and activism. Maybe it's because it's a smaller country. I think there's one tenth of the population of the U.S. and I feel like everybody knows everybody. Mm. It's kind of like it's the size of California basically in terms of population. Mm -hmm. So it's that level of everybody knows everybody, you're as cognizant of people, the networks kind of are nice and fertile, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Around that, thank you for those wonderful ideas and for <laughs> sharing some of those resources with folks to potentially check out. Anything you might want to share with listeners that are engaging this journey for themselves that might be sort of more closeted, so to speak, and yet have sincere questions or curiosities about what it might mean for them to do some of the work that you've been doing more openly for the past few years? I don't know, it's hard for me to answer that question because I recognize what a place of privilege I'm in. I mean, for me, I started out by reading a lot before I started doing this. And we're lucky with the internet, most of us, there are so many resources out there. And I have a links page on my Critical Polyamorous website where I link to feminist or decolonial or anti-racist kinds of uh, articles around open non-monogamy. So to me, that's that's a really important thing to do, to really read and, and figure out who's out there thinking about what issues to get your feet under yourself and to not feel bad about having to be quiet about it either. It doesn't mean that people aren't courageous. This world does not want you to do non-monogamy. And every song that you listen to on the radio, you know, in every movie, in every television show, if we didn't have compulsory monogamy, there wouldn't be any plots to anything, you know, like, <laughs> so it's not, it's not just about one's own personal courage or conviction. The whole system is designed to make you choose monogamy and the whole system is designed to shame you into that. This is a completely uphill battle, even for somebody that's privileged like me with all of the resources that I have. This is not easy. And I commend people who try it even for a little while, because it also can make your monogamous relationships better and more consensual and more communicative. But I also don't blame people who try it and decide, I just can't do this. This is too hard. You know, I totally get that. Mm -hmm. But it is something I think that maybe if you have the wherewithal, you can give a try. And especially if you're in a city where there is a community. And also don't feel bad when it's a bunch of middle class white people who you might not relate to either. There's still things I can learn from them. Mm -hmm. But I also manage my contact time in communities where I feel like they're not getting my feminist, indigenous, anti-racist politics. You know, you've got to kind of take your contact with people who don't get where you're coming from in small doses. Take what you can from that but also come back and feel like it's okay to retreat into your own community, right? You've got to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So. Thank you so much for that. And until we build the alternative communities, then sure, that's going to be the sort of compromised space that we're in, making the most of the opportunities available to us, being humble, but, learning. But this is why I feel like with all the privilege I have, I really should be more visible because I think it does help to give people an example that, you know, you know, you're not crazy, you're not commitment phobic, there's nothing wrong with you for not being comfortable with compulsory monogamy. There's nothing wrong with you. There's a good reason why you're not comfortable with it if you're not. Thank you. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners, either based on what we've discussed thus far and or the work that you've done, the work that you're doing? Well, so there's a little anecdote. You know, my daughter is almost 15, and I first told her about open non-monogamy when she was about 11, and she didn't get it. And as sex positive as her dad and I were, she was very weirded out by it. But she's really in the last few years, because I, I talked to her really openly about, about it, and she knows about my blog, and her dad knows, and she's met a few of my partners and luckily I'm only attracted to really nice nice people that are fine to be around children like I, I have a thing for nice people that like children and animals but she has come over the past four years to say well I think I'm monogamous but what she learned from polyamory was she said I you know I realized in school like I don't want to just hang out with one clique of girls you know I, I like to have different sets of friends that are in these different cliques and groups and I like to move around and have lunch with different kids on different days and she said people don't get it mom like they think I'm mad at them or you know how can I go eat with this group of kids this day and it's like well just because I like diversity in my life and she said that my polyamory has taught her that she can have a diversity of friends and a diversity of groups she mm. can hang out with and it's helped her she just doesn't succumb come to peer pressure. She's very mm. self-confident and purposeful about her relationships, even as a 14-year-old. And so I'm really grateful for that. Polyamory has a lot of lessons besides 
non-monogamous romantic relationships, right? Yeah, that's such a beautiful example around, again, your sort of intervention about making kin and really taking seriously the broader implications related to relationality, so not being so over-emphasizing sex or over-determining sex, especially physically or biologically, but all of the implications in terms of healing our relationships, frankly. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure. (laughs) Yeah, no, that was a great story. Thank you so much for your time, your energy, everything that you've shared, and this courageous, indispensable work that you're doing. Really appreciate your time. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much for having me on. In closing, here's an optional invitation. I encourage you to find out what words your ancestors would have used for sex, sexuality, eros, and related topics. For example, the word vagina is often seen as a neutral, anatomical term, but its roots in Latin actually mean sheath for a sword. Talk about a dictionary definition of phallocentrism, or dick-centeredness in layperson's terms. Most of my ancestors, by contrast, would have used the word yoni. This typically translates from Hindi as the source of creation, origin of life, sacred space, or creative source that moves through the universe. My, what a difference language makes in terms of how we relate to ourselves and each other. What words would your ancestors have used? And might that help inspire us to know ourselves better, decolonize, and get free? Be sure to let us know in the comment section below this recording. That's it for today's episode of Feral Visions, a decolonial feminist podcast brought to you by Liberation Spring. I've been your host, Anjali Nathupadia, and I thank you for listening. I'm also curious to know what this dialogue evoked for you. I invite you to post your reflections and questions in the comment section below to continue our collective journey of unlearning, remembering, and imagining. If you want to share feedback, such as segment ideas or potential guests you'd like to have on the show, email liberationspring at gmail.com. And don't forget to follow Feral Visions on SoundCloud, where you can find our show archive. If you'd like more information on this show's topic, check out liberationspring.com. Thanks to Catherine Petru and Nicole Gervasio of our technical production team and Climbing Poetry for our theme song. Be sure to tune in for next week's episode. And in the meantime, let's make our ancestors proud. Freedom is ours.